And we're now going to move on to time frequency analysis and coherence. So if I look at time frequency analysis, I need to check why, first of all, why do I want to do time frequency analysis? Uh, well, one reason is that I can reveal signal that is related to the stimulus, but it's not necessarily time locked to the stimulus. And if I average that kind of signal, then the not time locked signal will get lost. Um, so um, I can get some more information about my data if I use time frequency analysis because I keep this information about not time locked data. Also, um, if I want to calculate coherence between brain regions, this requires uh, a time frequency data decomposition. Uh, this is a little example. So I have a evoked signal here, and I can uh, see in the time frequency decomposition uh, where I've now got uh, my time axis on the right, my frequency axis is on the y axis, and I've got some uh, some activation um, that's indicated by the strength of activation and color coding. You can see the um, evoked in, in red and also some induced signal in this time frequency. If I, I can subtract the evoked signal and then I can just see the induced signal, which I will not see in the average. Yeah, so um, we get to the time frequency um, analysis results via convolution with um, different uh, functions, which I'll skip for time reasons. Mm. And uh, we can use this uh, time frequency decomposed data also as a basis for beamforming solutions and um, also for coherence analysis. Yeah, beamforming is uh, a nice uh, alternative way of source localization. And uh, in BISA research, it's realized as a time frequency beamformer. And that means we allow the source localization of evoked and also induced data. So um, both stimulus locked and not stimulus locked data, they can be uh, source localized using the beamformer. And uh, the result of the beamformer is a three dimensional image for the selected time frequency range. Yeah, then um, talking about uh, source montages again. So um, if you think of coherence, Coherence can be calculated on the scalp, but if we think of um, a source in the left auditory cortex, it shows signal uh, not just on an electrode above its activation, but also in other areas. So there's a propagation over the scalp of that, of that activity. Similarly, in the right auditory cortex, there will also be propagation. And um, now if I measure a coherence between these electrodes, C3 and C4, I'm not sure whether this is simply due to some propagation effect of the uh, volume conduction or whether this is really a true um, coherence between brain regions. So our approach is to first transform this scalp signal into uh, brain source signals using the source montages and then um, reconstructing the waveforms and then calculate the coherence between um, these source channels. I need to skip these. Uh, so I need to skip the explanation of coherence here. So this is something, uh, it's just a basic formulation of uh, coherence. And instead, I'm going to uh, show you some examples in a minute. Um, I just want to mention we have another coherence implementation as well called DICS. This is the dynamic imaging of coherent sources. And um, it's a method where that does not require you to create a source montage. It just works on uh, uh, any data that you uh, supply, any time frequency range, and uh, can be calculated between any pair of voxels in the brain. So that's the cortical cortical application, or between the brain and the uh, muscle, cortical muscular application. So um, it's related to beamforming techniques, and we can perceive it as a source localization technique for coherent activity. Um, what's the disadvantage and advantage between source coherence and DICS? In source coherence, 
we require a good source model for our source montage. Uh, this is influenced by regularization. Um, that's not so good, but the good thing is we can also get some causality information using the phase diagram. Uh, in DSCS, we don't need any a priori knowledge on the sources involved. No. In that way, it's a, a nearly automated method, but um, we don't get the information about causality. So both have their uh, pros and cons, and um, to study the effects of different um, approaches, we can use a simulated data set again, and this simulation is now um, based upon four different brain regions that are involved. Two are uh, static to a stimulus, so in the simulation there was two dipoles in auditory regions that became activated after a stimulus with a fixed offset. And uh, then there was two other regions, also close to these, but with different orientations, that uh, then became active at a later time. And these dipoles three and four, these have um, a different onset times, so they jitter in time of onset, they jitter in length of duration, and they jitter in the frequency. So they have uh, a variation in all these parameters. Now that data set looks like I'll show you in a minute. So um, this is the raw data. So the raw data show yeah, just a standard EEG that uh, on, onto which we superimposed our um, uh, simulated data. So uh, trigger number one is the um, stimulus that is then followed by a static response and the uh, jittering uh, that starts at trigger number two and you can see that trigger number two is always got different timing with respect to trigger number one. And if I average these up and show you the uh, result of the average, then I can see if I average uh, with trigger number one then I can get this response here, and uh, I can see very little of that oscillatory activity that starts later. If I average the trigger, num trigger number two, then I can see some of the oscillatory activity, but I can see hardly anything uh, of the static stimulus before. So that's the way we created the simulation. And um, if I look at this in source analysis, And the, bring, so if I bring up this one and also the other epoch, um, I can now load a solution that was created for this. Um, so these first four sources, let's go back. So this is the uh, condition where we averaged the first stimulus, and you can see the first two sources here, they show uh, the response uh, according to the um, stimulus, and then we've got the next two sources which should show the oscillatory response later on, but they are very much averaged out. And if I trigger my average uh, according to the oscillatory response, I can see there's some activity here, but not very much before in the first two sources. And uh, then I've got my other five sources here later that should simply summarize any other activity that goes on in the brain. So if I now apply this to the data, so I'm going to save this as a source montage, a solution, and I'm going to call it um, AC90 test RC1 because it's got a regularization constant of 1. Then um, Immediately, my data set here gets transformed into the source montage. And if I go back to my uh, ACOC20, I can also pick this source montage from the user button. So here it is. But I'm now going to work with the RC0. It's the same source montage. It just has a regularization constant of 0. And um, so I can see these little source symbols here. And I can see uh, my data have been transformed. And now I'm going to 
um, do a time frequency analysis on this. So um, this is done uh, using the ERP menu in BISA research. So I'm going to go to uh, uh, edit the paradigm. The pa I'm going to load the paradigm, actually. So the paradigm simply consists of two conditions with um, averaging the code number one and number two. Um, I can perform an artifact scan to get rid of any eye blinks and other uh, electrode artifacts. And I can change the number of accepted trials here. Um, so I've got 84% accepted trials. And then I go over to the coherence tab. And um, here I can get a trade-off between my time resolution and my frequency resolution in the, um, in the time frequency decomposition. And the 2 hertz and 25 milliseconds sampling, uh, this is kind of trade-off between um, best time and best frequency resolution. So I'm going to work with that and start the time frequency analysis. <clears throat> and um, this is the result of the time frequency analysis. And here I can see that I um, get my nine source channels. Um, and I can see the change in, activ in activation with respect to the baseline. So the interesting thing is that this channel here, the ACPR and the ACPL, these are the channels that actually have the highest response in the evoked um, potential. And the ACSR and the ACSL with a big red blob, this is the uh, simulated oscillatory activity that is not time locked. So if I show choose to show the aver the waveforms along with this underneath the time frequency plot i can see that uh, here here we've got the high evoke potentials you can see a little bit of red signal here but not much and the oscillatory response is nearly not present in the average but it's very strong in the time frequency decomposition let's switch these off again i can now also compute the coherence between um one channel and the others by double clicking on the channel and um, I can see that um, this channel is highly coherent with the other oscillatory channel so it's got about 80, 0 0.8 coherence value and it's got very little coherence with uh, any of the other channels apart from some noise that is um, similarly projected onto both source channels and creates some uh, noise coherence and also I can see some alpha rhythmic coherence at around the 10 hertz range that is uh, present in some channels because we didn't have a very good model for the alpha rhythm. <clears throat> so let's compare this to the, uh, to the scalp coherence. So if I go and pick the uh, reference free montage, for example, for um, uh, a standard montage and do the coherence analysis on this. So I now go back to ERP, coherence, start the time frequency analysis, and run through the trials. And now I can see that uh, I get this oscillatory activity in nearly all the channels. And also, if I double click on, say, A1 to get the coherence of this channel with the other channels, I also get a coherence with nearly all the other channels. And this is this volume conduction um, propagation effect over the scalp that is actually uh, allows doesn't allow me to um, dis, uh, distinguish between um, what is real coherence and what is actually uh, simply due to uh, propagation of activity. Yeah, um, so this is um, one lesson that uh, we believe that source coherence is uh, a better approach than using uh, scalp coherence. Now, um, there's two more little things um, that I find is so important I want to show you before time runs out. Uh, one is that we can use a beamformer on this time frequency data to localize activity. So if I find something that I'm interested in, uh, I can uh, left drag around it. I'm going to show you again. So I'll go left drag, and then I can select this image menu here. And um, now I can um, decide that I want to compute a beamformer image 
and uh, I'm going to work with an interval from say 450 to 750 and minus 300 to 0 and a frequency from say 16 to 28 Hertz and go and uh, now it uh, will compute the cross spectral density uh, across this and then um, show me the beamformer result and automatically jump to the highest maximum. So this is the uh, so-called multiple source beamformer. That means uh, it, it automatically chooses um, bilateral uh, positions for my um, voxels uh, that are evaluated during the beamforming computation. And uh, this should be um, preferable if I'm looking for potential bilateral activation. <clears throat> we also have a single source beamformer, which I can show you too. Um, so single source beamformer looks like this. So um, it uh, kind of has a much more spread activation over the two hemispheres and the uh, multiple source beamformer. So I can see the two maxima very nicely um, uh, activated around about where my sources were simulated, and the third maximum is very, very small, so it's negligible here. And then I also want to show one thing, one application with real data, and that is the uh, DICS applied to um, experiment where there was a potential coherence between the cortex and the muscular activation. So I'm going to open a data set that's an MEG data set now, uh, also in our standard example data set, um, DICS cortical muscular. So here we have a, a MEG recording with 151 uh, actual gradiometer channels and I'm just going to run the um, the time frequency. So what was done is that uh, a subject needed to um, exert a force against a lever with a, uh, one of the arms, I think left arm, um, and uh, then had to try and keep the force uh, steady over some time. And um, so we've now got, um, we've inserted triggers during this time when the uh, force was applied and uh, we can now compute the time frequency this um, decomposition of this uh, where we actually only care about the frequency and then we will calculate the DICS between the um, cortical activation and the muscular uh, activation. <clears throat> So um, after we get the uh, time frequency activation finished, we've got uh, many channels now to show in our time frequency diagram because it always works on the currently selected montage. And I just want to show the absolute um, rather than the difference to the baseline. And so I'm going to show the absolute um, power and I'm just going to concentrate now on the EMG channel. So I'm right click and show only this channel. This is going to take a little while till all the channels have rearranged themselves, uh, deleted from the display and the new channel is shown. So it's going to take another few seconds. Here we go. Now I need to scale this up quite largely until the activity comes up. So now I can see some activation and I can see that at around 15 hertz there is a band of activity that uh, becomes active and I can use this band and try and get its coherence with uh, the brain. So image. Now I'm going to uh, use the DICS option here and choose an interval from 0 to 500 and the baseline minus 500 to 0, from 12 to 18 hertz, go. And again, um, now it has to go through the data set again to calculate this cross-spectral density matrix that is used for the DICS computation.
And um, I can now choose what my uh, reference channel is for the DICS. And in this case, because I'm looking for the coherence between the muscle and muscular activity that was measured with the EMG channel and the brain, I want to use this external channel as a reference. So OK. And now I get the uh, DICS computation. <clears throat> And yeah, I get indeed um, sort of a uh, very focal maximum in the right hemisphere in the um, somatomotor area where my, my movement in the left uh, arm was um, is coherent with um, this brain activity at uh, between 12 and 18 hertz. So we didn't put any assumptions in that. We just um, used the raw data and we got a completely automated analysis showed us this result and we get a few more activation centers that could also be of interest. Um, yeah, and so that's also a, a nice of alternative to the uh, source coherence using this type of um, coherence estimator. So now this is the end of my quick presentation on the time frequency and coherence. And Ryan, I think we are maybe running out of time, otherwise I would have had something about statistics, but we maybe don't have any time left. Is that right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think we have to call it a day for now. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so I can just say that uh, we do also have a statistics package that's very powerful that allows us to analyze the uh, groups uh, that uh, apply the group differences between conditions in either t-tests or ANOVAs and um, uses a method called um, cluster permutation statistics that automatically accounts for multiple test corrections and uh, has already been used in many publications and so maybe another time I would be very happy to show you that too. <laughs> but so now I'll maybe stop and uh, listen to questions. Uh, for resting state, we have a number of um, we have we have some new source montages available for resting state analysis. So um, what we can do is um, if I go back to the this example file, uh, we have. Um, a button here called SRC where our standardized source montages are kept and um, in this we have a subsection called resting state montages and uh, we can um, we have optimized some source montages to analyze the default mode network and also three other networks that have been identified using combined fMRI EG studies um, so if I go to the DMN then this data is now um, transformed into um, yeah, uh, default mode network sources. Uh, these are um, regional sources. So um, we have two, three, four, five, six um, sources accounting for the different um, aspects of the default mode network plus another six sources that should account for noise, so for unrelated brain activity. The sources are, um, you can see there a rough representation where they are by right-clicking on their labels. So they are in the different um, aspects that are relevant to the TMN. This one, for example, is typical for alpha rhythm, and you can see already that it picks up a lot of alpha here. Um, we can then, uh, if you want to study this in time frequency, you can create triggers in regular intervals and then um, use these trigger intervals for time frequency decomposition and analyze coherence between the different um, different uh, sources, for example. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, this is also something we have in the coherence module. So if we go back to 
the coherence. So instead of um, uh, calculating coherence, we can also calculate the um, uh, phase locking value. And um, this is um, yeah just um, uh, available from the from the toolbar in the coherence module. Okay, thank you. <clears throat>